On this edition for Saturday, November 2nd, the latest on the impeachment inquiry. We got to impeach him because we can't beat him. Fire warnings remain in parts of California. And in our signature segment, sending people with addictions to jail for rehab. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Megan Thompson. Good evening and thank you for joining us. From Washington, D.C. to Iowa to Mississippi, the topic on the presidential campaign trail for the past 24 hours was impeachment. On his way to a campaign event last night, President Trump called the impeachment inquiry a hoax. At the rally in Tupelo, Mississippi, Mr. Trump drew cheers and chants when he accused the media and Democrats of a long campaign to remove him from office. They've been plotting to overthrow the election since the moment I won, but the people here that are highly sophisticated know long before I won. In Iowa, Democratic candidates were racing from event to event, talking more about health care, the economy, and climate change than why the president should be impeached. The February 3rd Iowa caucuses, the first presidential vote in 2020, are now just three months away. Dangerous fire conditions continued in California today, even as the winds died down in many areas of the state. The Maria Fire in Ventura County, north of Los Angeles, has burned more than 9,000 acres since it began Thursday night and was still only 20 percent contained by this morning. Officials kept red flag warnings in place across the region with relative humidity less than 10 percent and wind gusts still expected to reach 35 miles per hour. Many fires burning throughout the state for more than a week are now coming under control. There have been evacuations, school closings, the destruction of homes and other buildings, and injuries to firefighters in the most recent fires. But to date, there have been no fatalities. The United Auto Workers Union announced today that its current president is stepping aside amidst a federal corruption investigation of its leadership. Gary Jones, who's held the top job at the union for less than two years, will start his leave of absence as soon as tomorrow. On Thursday, federal prosecutors accused Jones and a close aide of conspiring to embezzle close to $700,000 in member dues. It's the latest development in a corruption probe that became public in 2017. In West Africa, at least 50 soldiers and one civilian are dead following an attack on a military outpost in Mali. The assault took place yesterday in the northeast region of Manaka. Today, a government spokesperson said armed men carried out the attack and then fled to the border with Niger. No group has claimed responsibility for the violence, but the region has active groups with links to al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. This is the second attack on Mali's military in less than two months and one of the deadliest in recent history. In Afghanistan, nine children were killed after they stepped on a deliberately planted roadside mine while walking to school today. The police chief of the northeastern Takar province, an area under Taliban control, blamed Taliban insurgents and said the bomb was most likely intended for Afghan security forces. Civilian casualties in Afghanistan spiked in the months leading up to September's presidential election and have hit record levels. So far, no one has claimed responsibility for today's attack. In Hong Kong, anti-government protesters threw gasoline bombs at police and attacked the office of China's official news agency today after China hinted that it may begin a tougher crackdown. <laughs> police hurled tear gas and used water cannons on the demonstrators who demanded autonomy for Hong Kong. Protesters who broke into China's Xinhua News Agency office smashed windows, set a small fire, and spray-painted a wall with a message that read, Deport the Chinese Communists. More than 3,000 protesters have been detained since the unrest in Hong Kong began almost five months ago. Few states have been hit harder by the opioid epidemic than Massachusetts. Last year alone, about 2,000 people there died of opioid-related overdoses. For friends and family looking to help their loved ones on the road to recovery, the state has a law that sends men in particular to be treated while living in jail. Some call that old-fashioned incarceration. 
Others say it's the lifeline the men need to fight their addiction. NewsHour Weekend's Hari Srinivasan has more. Correct. Past Correct. the secure gates of the Hamden County Jail in western Massachusetts, Sheriff Nick Kochi is taking us to meet incarcerated men who haven't necessarily committed a crime. These are all people that are at a, a point in their life where forced treatment and necessary immediate treatment was called for. The sheriff runs a program for men who've been civilly committed for substance abuse treatment under a Massachusetts law called Section 35. Here, for the first, uh, say, four or five weeks, you can't go anywhere. You're here. Our first stop is a daily mindfulness meditation class. Someone watching this, they're literally going to hear the new age music and they're going to see guys on floor mats deep breathing and they're yeah. going to say, what's going on with the sheriff? He's supposed to be making tough sure. Guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I've always said this. A fair county sheriff is giving them the resources and the tools to address those issues and to go back into the community and be successful, uh, we're saying there's a better life and we're saying we can help you get there. Under Section 35, a family member, police officer, or doctor can petition a court to commit an individual, that is, hold them involuntarily if that person has an alcohol or substance abuse problem and is a risk of serious harm to themselves or others. Similar to involuntary commitment for mental illness, after an evaluation by a clinician, a judge can section a person, as the process is known, for up to 90 days. For women, that means receiving treatment in a civil facility, but for most men, it means getting treatment in a jail. It's a tool to be used as a last resort. We would love for people to uh, put their hand up and say, I have an addiction issue and I need help, and I'm willing to go get that help, but that's not the case all the time. So it's important that the family members have an option that they can help bring their loved one and actually get them the help that they need, whether they're ready for it, prepared for it, or want it or not. The law has been on the books since 1970, but the number of people committed has gone up nearly 66% in the past 10 years, thanks to the opioid crisis. The noise level's down, it's the, there's not a lot of commotion. In Kochi's program, the men are housed in a unit that's isolated from those who are criminally incarcerated. The men are called clients rather than inmates or prisoners. There's 24-7 medical treatment available, including drugs like methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone, all of which are FDA approved to treat opioid addiction. And there's access to addiction counselors and daily group therapy. The rooms are jail cells, but Sheriff Kochi says the doors are not locked and the men here aren't confined to them. So the, the days are very structured, but they're not structured to where we force anyone to do anything. Uh, you have to voluntarily get up and go to class. Yeah. There are even therapy dogs. How you feel? Nervous, but good. I'm ready. Was it worthwhile to be here? Yeah, absolutely. Good. After several weeks at the unit in the jail, many men, quote, stepped down to a facility about 20 minutes away in Springfield. Located in a renovated nursing home, it has fewer restrictions and is more like a dorm. The emphasis remains on recovery. It's getting in touch with your inner peace, the way we were hitting the drums. We have to find that because it's not the drinking the drug. It's enjoying life without it. 39-year-old Antoine Diaz has struggled with addiction for more than a decade. He lost his brother to a heroin overdose last year. This time when I relapsed, my twin brother was dead. And that's when it's, it's easier to die. It really is. People are not really suicidal, but they just, the pain and the suffering becomes overbearing that they just want to shoot it away. And next thing you know, it could be a bad batch and you're gone. And I experienced that this time. I was dead for three and a half minutes. No heartbeat, no nothing. After being revived, Diaz was sectioned by his family. Then they came and said, you're getting sectioned. I flipped out. I hated my wife. I hated everybody. But she was right. I needed to be removed. That's what a section is. You need to be removed from society. Since the program began last May, more than 1,000 people have gone through the Section 35 program in Hamden County. And the Sheriff's Department says fewer than 5% have been sectioned again. But it doesn't track relapses that don't result in another civil commitment. We're not telling you that we have a magic wand and we can wave it and we can cure people because there is no cure. We're engaged every day trying to be part of the solution in taking another chunk out of this ravaging, ugly disease of opioid addiction. Antoine Diaz credits the approach of the Hamden County Sheriff with helping him get to this point. I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't like Kochi, right? Well, for Sheriff, I had another guy I liked. But I swear to God to you, I swear to you, 
his message and his way for recovery is passionate, real. The programming, everything is, is progressive. It's like, it's different. Over here, we have another uh, classroom area. To pay for the program's first year, Kochi reallocated nearly $3 million from the existing Sheriff's Department budget. And in July, the Massachusetts legislature earmarked an additional million dollars for the program. Now, $1 million is a drop in the hat, but it was a major move in the right direction, especially with all the people that are criticizing the program. Why would you have a system where instead of using health care settings to treat a disease, you put that money into prisons? Bonnie Teneriello is one of those critics. She's a staff attorney at Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts, a nonprofit group that represents incarcerated people. It may be a nicer environment than a, an ordinary uh, prison setting, but it's still a prison. And you're still telling people you belong in jail. There's already enough stigma around addiction that for us to say it's okay to put people with addiction in jail just furthers that stigma, furthers a belief in our communities that these people are bad. Uh, and that's going to stop people from getting treatment. Teneriello is suing the state to end the use of jails for treatment on behalf of 10 men who have been sectioned at a facility in Plymouth called the Massachusetts Alcohol and Substance Abuse Center, or MASAC. The suit alleges abusive behavior by corrections officers, minimal substance abuse treatment, and overall, a traumatizing experience for people sectioned there. If you put people in jail, they're going to act like they're in jail, and a lot of people did. 37-year-old Joel Kergaravat is not one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit, but he spent several weeks in MASAC. He was sectioned by his family last June after struggling with opioid addiction. The Department of Corrections is equipped to handle prisoners. They're not equipped to handle mentally ill or sick people. Um, that was evidenced by the fact that they would, you know, refer to us as junkies and, you know, pieces of shit. and it's not, it's not their arena. Kirgaravat has so been I, sober for about a year, but he says that's in spite of his experience at MASAC, not because of it. There isn't, there's no treatment, nothing I would consider treatment there. It felt like having gone to jail for for a period of time for a um, crime I didn't commit. Citing the pending litigation, the Massachusetts Department of Correction, which operates MASAC, declined an interview with PBS NewsHour Weekend. But in court filings, the state denied the suit's allegations and strongly rejects, as both a factual matter and a legal matter, the suggestion that the commitment of Section 35 patients to its facilities is equivalent to incarceration or imprisonment. The Hamden County Sheriff's Department is not specifically named as a defendant, but Bonnie Teneriello says the lawsuit aims to end the use of jails for all Section 35 commitments across the state. She says that would simply put men and women in the state on equal ground. Remember, women who are sectioned are treated only in civil settings. That's because in 2016, the Massachusetts legislature explicitly changed the law. And there's now pending legislation that would do the same for men. In September, a joint committee of state legislators held a hearing on this issue. We are the only state in the nation that sends people with addictions for involuntary treatment to a prison facility. This is what we need to change and what we want to change. And in July, a state commission also recommended that Massachusetts end the practice. When people point at us and say, yeah, this shouldn't happen there, well, where else is it going to happen? There was not one bed for these type of men in western Massachusetts till we opened this program a year ago. And now they want to tell me, well, you shouldn't be doing it? Hey, how about a phone call and say thank you? I'll take those calls all day long. Antoine Diaz says the setting in a criminal justice facility is not what makes being sectioned hard. It's not jail, you're civil. It doesn't matter where they house you at. In reality, being here, people don't want to be left alone. Being here is hard for me, you know why? Because I, I have to be left with me. And I'm the problem, and it's uncomfortable but it teaches me how to grow, you know? It did not feel like jail, and I did a jail bed. Instead of taking shots at us, come on down and see it for yourself. Sheriff Kochi says he's open to having his program regulated by civil agencies in the state, including the Department of Public Health. But in the meantime, he says, the stakes could not be higher. Take my 120 beds away, then what? How many funerals are we going to? How many family members have, have got to, to bury a loved one? I'm not going to be on that side of the coin. That's a false choice. You, you, 
you have you need a civilian setting for these people. We're not saying take the treatment away. What we want is a commitment to fund and make available treatment in healthcare settings where it belongs. Teneriello supports the pending state legislation to make that happen. But Sheriff Kochi argues that his program should be allowed to continue, even if others in the state are not. I would ask, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, please. If we're doing it right, acknowledge that. Carve us out. Allow us to do what we're doing. For now, the sheriff will continue doing exactly that. But opposition to providing treatment for civilly committed men behind these gates remains. To read a mother's account of how the Massachusetts law impacted her son, visit pbs.org slash newshour. In 2015, Washington Post data reporter Christopher Ingram wrote about an obscure U.S. Department of Agriculture list that ranked every county on natural amenities like scenery and climate. Dead last was Red Lake County in rural Midwestern Minnesota. Ingram called it, quote, the absolute worst place to live in America. But then, less than a year later, he decided to move his family there. He details that story in his new book, If You Lived Here, You'd Be Home By Now. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So you write this post, you call Red Lake County the worst place to live. What happened next? You know, what happened is I started hearing a lot from people in this particular corner of the state, Red Lake County. They started sending me pictures on social media being like, look at this place. What are you talking about? There's rivers and hills and bluffs. Um, and it kind of snowballed. Uh, you know, and I started to learn that Minnesota is kind of like the Texas of the north. You know, we all know that you don't mess with Texas, but I learned very quickly that you don't mess with Minnesota either because their media outlets picked up on it. Um, and then the politicians started to get in on it. Um, I heard from the senators, um, Senator Amy Klobuchar, she spent half an afternoon just sending me pictures on Facebook being like, look at this place, what is wrong with you? Why would you say these <laughs> horrible things about our place? Um, and this was really interesting to me because I'm a data reporter and I write about stuff like this all the time. And like every kind of ranking you do, somebody is always at the the absolute bottom, right? But I never heard kind of feedback like this, right? Like, you know, you I've written a bunch of stories where you have, say, Minis uh, Mississippi or Alabama at the bottom of some ranking. Never a peep from folks in those states, interestingly, interestingly enough. But Minnesotans apparently were not used to um, showing up at the bottom of the list, and they let me know about it. In the interest of full disclosure, I am from Minnesota originally. OK, were you one of the ones I got a nasty email from? I did not email you, no. <laughs> But okay. I do know that Minnesota nice, it's a thing, right? Um, even though I don't want to brag, we're not supposed to brag. You know, if you're from Minnesota, you don't brag. But um, you were they actually you were actually right. invited to visit Minnesota, right? I mean, is is that what you found when you when you got there? Minnesota nice? Yeah, so eventually this guy, this local guy in Red Lake County, he's like, look, if you're going to say all this stuff about us, you should really come out here and take a look. And, you know, I kind of told my wife about this. I'm like, they want me to come out there. Do you think I should do it? And she was like, no, they're going to kill you. Do not go out there. <laughs> um, but my editor was kind of like, yeah, go. Let's go see what happens. Um, and so I went and visited. And I was expecting kind of, you know, we have these, this, these ideas about rural America, this kind of hillbilly algae framework where everybody is struggling and everybody is poor and everybody is on drugs and things are really bad. And that's kind of what I was expecting going in there. Um, but I show up in this town and it, it was more like Norman Rockwell. It was very just Americana. You know, I, I pulled up to the county courthouse to meet with this guy, Jason, who invited me. They had actually gathered the mayor, this, uh, the county commissioners. They had a marching band there playing on the courthouse steps. It was just ridiculous. And it just kind of, that set the tone for the entire visit. I was just shocked by how much people just wanted to show me um, their community and the people they knew. Just the amount of civic pride in this place was unlike anything I've encountered anywhere else in my life. So you went home to your family in Baltimore, and then you ended up making a huge life decision. Yeah, so this was happening at kind of a, a strange point in our lives. My, we were living in uh, Baltimore County, so I was commuting down to the Washington, D.C. offices every day. So hour and a half, one-way commute adds up to about 15 hours a week. I'm never seeing the kids. I'm never seeing my wife, Brianna. She's working for the government, long hours. We're both burned out. Um, the problem is uh, the cost of living out there is so high. We couldn't see a way out of it. Um, and eventually, of all people, it was my mother 
who was visiting us one day, and she was like, well, you know, you guys ought to go move to that nice little Minnesota town you visited over the summer. And we were kind of like, ha, 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 that's funny, Mom. That's what a silly idea. But the thing is, like, once that seed got planted, like, it just started to grow. And we started crunching some numbers. And basically, we got to a point where we convinced ourselves that it would have been financially irresponsible of us to not move to rural Minnesota. So um, after getting uh, approval from my uh, editors at The Post to, to be, able, be able to work remotely, which, of course, is a huge part of this, um, that's what we ended up doing. So you've been out there now for a little over three years. How's it been going? What have you been finding? Um, it's been going great. You know, we moved out here primarily. We were thinking of doing it for the kids. And on that level, it's just completely exceeded our wildest expectations. Um, it, it, so the town we live in, Red Lake Falls, it's 1,400 people. And, uh, you know, I can we can send our kids out in the yard to play, and we know that people out there, they have their backs. Um, and this is one of the harder things to articulate, but from a physical standpoint, from going, to, going from the DC metro area, one of the densest populated places in the country, moving out to a rural area where the population density is something like 10 people per square mile, you feel the space out here. You feel the sky. You feel the air around you. At the end of the day, you know, I'm still plugged into DC. I'm still writing for the Post. But at the end of the day, I shut down my laptop. I step outside, and I can just feel the stress, like, just flow out of my body. Um, you know, one, uh, I'm a data guy, and one of the data points that I, I look at at that is that since I've moved out here, my blood pressure has actually fallen by 30 points. Um, so it's honestly, in many ways, has, maze has been everything we've hoped for and more. Christopher Ingram, author of If You Lived Here, You'd Be Home By Now. Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Saturday. In case you didn't get to the west coast of Denmark to see the annual Sand Sculpture Festival this year, we have a glimpse. In May, dozens of artists tackled massive blocks of damp sand brought in from a nearby quarry. The theme this year? Robots. It's one of the biggest sand sculpture events in the world. It's, and I think, I think that's unique. It's, one of, it's the only one where the artist gets um, complete freedom in what we make and how we make it, how we tell the story we want to tell. It can take five days to craft a 13-foot tall sculpture, and it helps that there's clay in this particular sand. Yeah, you can use tools, but I also like to work with my hands. You can see this on a video, and you can see this on photographs, but walking in between this atmosphere, you know, there's, there's nothing in the world that can beat that. That's just, it's awesome. More than 120,000 visitors took in the robot creations before the park closed last weekend. So amazing. I have never seen something like it. I never thought it uh, just made out of sand could be so perfect. It's amazing. I cannot, I, I cannot uh, describe it by any, anything else, but uh, it's, it's fantastic, I think. One frequently asked question is, what happens when it rains? The answer, according to organizers, nothing. The sand is already damp, so the water gradually drains through it. But just like sandcastles, the waves wash away at the beach. Eventually, wind and rain and sun take their toll, and the sculptures only last about four months. But the sand gets reused, and next year, artists will build again, when the new theme will be the Middle Ages. And finally tonight, thousands of fans lined Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. this afternoon to celebrate their hometown baseball heroes' World Series victory. The Nationals' four-game to three victory was the first World Series win for a D.C. team since 1924. And that's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Megan Thompson. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.